On the Informer, we have an opportunity to catch up with a television commentator who has been following the, the game, the world game, for the better part of the last 25 years. He might tell me it's even longer, but my memory's not that good. Uh, I know him best as a former colleague at SBS. Um, you probably are very aware of him if you've followed the world game. His name is David Bashir, and he joins us to talk about some of the most outstanding news that the game has heard. The decision last week by Infantino, the head of FIFA, to award the Women's World Cup, the 2023 tournament, to Australia and New Zealand. Have you recovered, David? It's uh, amazing news, George. Um, thanks for having me along. I think it's a terrific uh, boost in the arm, a shot in the arm that football needed in this country because uh, through this whole COVID uh, pandemic, I think the A-League has been the forgotten sport in Australia. So it's put uh, football back on the map. Let's hope now, um, as opposed to perhaps the, the Asian Cup and the Olympics of 2000, that the football can profit from this news. But it's certainly very, very exciting. And I think having covered four Women's World Cups for SBS, and the most recent was last year, in France and seeing the impact that that World Cup had on the, you know, the knowledge, the appreciation, uh, the progression of women's football, I hope it has the same impact in Australia. Uh, David, you've been a long time follower and lover of the game. I remember the early days of SBS. We were so excited about the arrival of some superstars to the game. People like uh, Diego Maradona and others of that ilk. Uh, Messi was, hadn't arrived yet. Ronaldo was just about on the, uh, on the horizon. Um, what did last year mean for you? Because we would have heard for the first time some outstanding names that have been realised in that they're great young players and they're women who are changing the way football is played. Absolutely. I think the, the, the messaging was really important too, George. I think Megan Rapinoe, the way... You know, she took on President Trump. We all, we all saw that was a very public battle. But the way she fought for, for equal pay parity, and on that point, I think Australia has a, a lot to, um, you know, applaud itself on and a lot to celebrate and a really great narrative move into the next uh, World Cup because, as we know, there's equal pay parity between the Socceroos and the Matildas, which is really important. And I think Megan Rapinoe using the World Cup uh, victory uh, for the United States uh, over the Netherlands um, to progress uh, the women's game, to talk about equal opportunity, to talk about a whole lot of social um, and, and gender equality issues was really, really important. But the bottom line is, you know, the, the standard of women's football every four years, every four years of a World Cup cycle, it, it noticeably improves. And I think some of the, the outstanding play uh, of France, the host nation, which I, I believe were probably the most talented team in the last World Cup, uh, the United States have been a, a great force, but even Australia in their, you know, in their muddled preparation with the change of coach and so forth, I think um, four years on from that, Australia will have a, a great chance to progress deep in the tournament. Uh, David, I've noticed uh, uh, it, when it comes to the Matildas and we talk about them, we, we have a terrific crop of players, but at the very top end, if you want to be super critical, it's, it's just like they've needed a little polish and suddenly, we're seeing Samantha Kerr not playing in the W League, but playing in, in Britain for Chelsea. We're seeing um, uh, three or four of her teammates, and now young Ellie Carpenter, who's just won a title with Melbourne City, she's off to France to, to play there for one of the biggest teams in, in Europe. So it seems to me that the timing is even better because our superstars, or our, or our stars, our current stars, will be super with the added uh, competition and the smarts that they're going to pick up playing the world game across the uh, across the uh, other end of the world. Yeah, absolutely, and I think Ellie Carpenter's a point in in case um, you know she all she needs now she's a prodigious young talent, great athlete, but she just needs that that game craft, the technical savvy of some of the better players in the world, and she'll get that in a very very tough league in Europe. But you know, Caitlin Ford and and Sam Kerr, of course, starring. In England, uh, Emily Van Egmond's played all over the world. Uh, there's a host of other players that are coming through, and, and there's such an appetite for women's football in this country. Even as a few of the fringe Matildas missed out, and they were playing, you know, in leagues such as La Liga in Spain and in other top leagues around the world. So, you're absolutely right. I think uh, the Matildas just need that that five ten percent of match craft under pressure against some of the bigger nations in world football. So. 
if they get that um, and they can sort of manage their situation a lot better in, in those pressure moments in World Cup football, um, then I think they're going to be a lot better, um, you know, performed at that level. You know, remember, I think 2015 was a, a seminal World Cup. Uh, we beat Brazil and then we were beaten by Japan in the quarterfinals. Uh, that, that was a, I, I think by the time we got to Japan, we were sort of um, emptied out as far as energy goes. But um, we've been very, very close in, in, in key tournaments. I think it's our time to really, really push. And let's hope we, we have that type of momentum. And, and the players, you know, you, you think about it, two or three years on from this point in time, they should be ready to compete against the bigger nations in the world, given where they're playing at the moment. And I think that's the absolute point. Uh, whether Ante Milicic um, is there as coach, who knows? You know, there's some noises. You may know more than I do on that one, George, but there's some noises that he's going to be with the Rams next season in the A-League, which will preclude him from coaching the Matildas. But watch the space. Uh, I don't think that's uh, played out fully yet. You know what? Uh, I'm, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I have a new newfound confidence. I never imagined that FIFA would make the decision in our favour. I was thinking that the way the numbers were counting, it was looking like Colombia suddenly was going to get it. And when you heard the spin that FIFA provided after the results were handed out, it, it, everyone was wondering why, why Greece, why England, why France all went with uh, Colombia. And you then heard it was about promoting the game. Uh, in areas or in countries that didn't have big women's leagues. Uh, and that sort of made sense. But I, I, I am now faith or faithfully uh, confident that if a woman is to step up and do it, then we have the talent on board in this country to, to, to uh, take it to the next level. But the question I have for you before we finish, what message does this announcement uh, throw up to all the young players who might have been considering maybe doing six months playing AFLW or maybe playing uh, cricket uh, uh, for the Australian cricket team, which has also played in the World Cup. Uh, I'm talking about those wonderfully gifted players who maybe have enough talent to play in two or three sports. Do you think this might galvanise them and say, no, no, I'm going to put my faith and my hopes on becoming a Matilda? I think so initially, but I think it's up to football in this country, George, to really, um, you know, get its act together as far as um, providing the right pathways for women. And that's not just the W League, but, um, you know, having enough contracted players um, uh, through the FFA for the Matildas, providing the sort of commercial returns that women's footballers are enjoying in other parts of the world. So I, I reckon it's really incumbent upon the FFA to take advantage. There's a really nice article um, on the World Game today that uh, obviously from quotes of Ange Postacoglu from uh, his comments of the Women's World Cup that, you know, we missed our opportunity in 2000 at the Olympics yep. and 2015 the Asian Cup yep. to really profit from, from you know, global events coming to our shores. So really the challenge is on um, uh, Football Federation Australia, all the, you know, all the participants of, of football in this country, the state federations to all come together and profit from this global phenomenon. And it will be a global phenomenon. Australia always hosts world events magnificently. I don't think the 2023 Women's World Cup will be any uh, different from that. And uh, France showed me uh, if they play at realistic stadia, they promote all the, the positives of the women's game, then the World Cup can be a, a real, really good success. But it, it's up to us. We know football is not the one, number one code in Australia by any means. It's far from it but just within realistic um, aims to profit from this uh, global uh, World Cup because we really do need to, to not only host the event, but also um, get all the infrastructure, uh, the government support. You know, we're, we're lacking in assets, and I'm, I'm sure you know that, George. We're lacking, football lacks in its own assets in, in Australia. So if we can come out of this World Cup having purpose-built stadia uh, that, that the A-League and the W-League profit, as well as the MPLs around of the country, then I think, uh, you know, we'll, you know, we will uh, profit from it the way we should as a sport.